Um, people like Michelangelo and Da Vinci and Johann Wolfgang von Goethe would be kind of jealous because we got a true 20, 20 and 21st century Renaissance man sitting here next to us. Um, a man who, according to his son, didn't only open doors, he blew him off the hinges. Please welcome Mr. Melvin for Peebles. Thank you. You know what's very funny? Um, the way I, I usually, I don't usually have an opportunity to, to speak. Um, and since I never, I have Alzheimer's, you know what that is? When you get old, you can't remember shit? That's me, okay. <laughs> so I, I never bother with um, preparing a speech because it's very difficult to know the questions that people will have. And, but I do know the answers, so to the questions if they concern me. And um, the way I normally do it is um, ask me anything you want to know. And I'll tell you, the, the, I was born in Chicago many years ago. I've lived all around the world. I've flown jet bombers. I've been a crime reporter in Paris and et cetera. And I've lived in Mario, for example, was born in Mexico when I used to live in Mexico. And so that's, that's pretty much it. Except I have a, a very bad temper and I decided that I wasn't going to take any shit. And from that, I did not know a musical revolution was in the, in the future but it seems that some of the things I did helped along that revolution. And for me to be here and to see the music last night and the other things that you people are doing, wow, that's fucking dream come true. Hmm? This, is, this is what I imagined. And I'm very appreciative for the Red Bull Festival to, to ask me and Eathon and um, to put me in contact and so if you have any questions after he gives his so forth ask me any fucking thing I don't mind well I'm pretty sure we're gonna take you up on that um, now you said you were talking about those revolutions and yesterday Raul um, kindly told us about how um, the more advanced things over here happened with bored rich kids the jeunesse de Lille kind of type of characters now Going back to how most of us would be getting in touch with your work was um, probably through the films of your son and his comrades and their course, and then going back of like, oh, uh, oh yeah, they're actually quoting from some stuff that was made even before we all were born. And realizing, hey, fuck it, you don't need to go to like the best film school ever and you don't need to know all the producers in Hollywood or whatever. There were guys there back in the 70s or the early 70s who just did what they did because they felt like it. And if it took the gonorrhea money from the Actors Guild, hell, we're just gonna do it as long as we can do it ourselves. And in a way, I guess there was a lot of inspiration for if you want to call it the hip hop generation, to do things with just whatever you have. Well, what the, the actual trajectory of the music, a lot of it came out of, out of what I did um, in the following manner. Um, I'll tell you my life story in, in five minutes. I was born in Chicago. I was a child prodigy and I finished college when I was 20 years old. And, but to finish college, because my parents were poor, I took um, a course. I didn't know what the course was, but the course meant I was an officer in the Air Force. So when I was 20, I was flying jets. Um, and I did that for a number of years. 
and then I lived in Mexico where Mario was born. And then I lived in San Francisco and I fell in love um, with, well, I'd always been in love actually with cinema and someone, I wrote a book and someone got on my cable car. I used to be a gripman, you know, those big guys that pull the, the, the cable cars. Well, and someone said, hmm? The yeah. brake kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, up and it's a big metal piece and so forth. And the, the guy said, you know, your book is just like a movie. I said, shit, I'll go into movies. And so that's how I went into movies. There was one little thing, though. I didn't have any, any music. And so I couldn't afford anyone. So I numbered all the keys on the piano because I didn't know how to read or write music and I wrote the numbers and then I played the music. However, when I finished my films, Hollywood would not take a black person to work. And so I was discouraged and went to Holland and I was getting my PhD in another something, in astronomy, I'm an astronomer, mathematician also. And while I was in Holland, the French Cinema Tech saw my work and said I was a genius. And I said, ah, finally somebody who understands me. <laughs> 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 and so I went, to, I went to, to Paris and I made my first feature there after seven years. I was a, used to be a, what we call clochard. I used to to beg in the streets and little by little I learned to speak French because that was a problem. I didn't know to speak French. And then I, I wrote the score and then I made another movie later called Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song and I wrote the music for that and that started taking off. And at that time what was happening um, was there were the, what we call the, the black revolution was going on in America. But the music was not revolutionary. And it was still blues or just straight jazz, but none of it talked about what was really going on. And since I couldn't sing, I started doing music however myself and th this took off and this became hip hop and it became rap and, th and that's what happened um, and that's that's the story Jerry so out of the about maybe 25 professions you mastered and I'm just wild guessing there I might have missed two or three here and there somewhere along the sidelines um, the common thread going through all of these is storytelling and narratives. Were you a good storyteller at school already? Well, I always was full of shit, if that's what you mean. <laughs> we call that storytelling elsewhere. <laughs> um, well, what I've, I'm very political, and what I wanted to do was you have to keep your audience interested also it, to, to tell the story. Um, and when I, I, I won the festival in San Francisco with my first French feature, I had no money. And so I was, went back to, uh, to New York and I was living on the park bench, you know. Where, and the first night I heard this noise and it was people, um, singing or, or, or yelling up to their loved ones in the women's house of detention. Now, there's only one thing that I really ask you guys to do. It's like medieval age yeah. singing, right? If I say something that you don't understand, you don't have to nod, ask me, and it, he'll translate or I will explain it, okay? Because it's quite interesting what, what I, at least I think is interesting what I have to say, but it's sometimes it's, it's intricate. And so if, if you don't understand what I'm saying, please stop me and l let's, let's, let's get it clear. Anyway, I was, 
a close shot, a bum, a tramp living on this. Um, this is after I had the success with my first feature film. Um, I, w I had no money once again, and but I heard this the people yelling um, because the, the women prison, the women couldn't yell out, but their loved ones could yell up. And so there was this whole wonderful, wonderful world of, of, of people talking to their loved ones. And I said, wow, this would make a great song. Hmm? And so I wrote a song, da 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 Hey, fourth floor. Hey, sugar, that your light? Make some kind of sign so I know it's you. So what the women would do, they would blink. They would blink the 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 window so the other person could say, "I love you." And so the, the people would, come on, en français, vide le tri, baby. They would they would open their hearts up to their loved one. It was it was poignant. It was wonderful. So, but no one was capturing this, and so I was started capturing these sort of stories and I put them into an album and that was the the beginning of once more music or the lyrics to music um, saying something. What happened, music in the early 60s were simply, vocals were simply accompaniment to the music sort of Hey, baby, baba, baba, da, 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 but never said anything, and I wanted to tell a story. So I, I brought down the orchestrations and raised up the story, and that's because you, you want, you, 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 you wanted to, I wanted to tell the story. The, another time, I was uh, sitting in a, in a dinky, in a little restaurant, and someone went along and everybody said, hey, look at that. And I turned around too late to see the girl going past. And that gave me an idea for a story, which we call Catch That on the Corner. And that's a story of, of a blind guy who fell in love. Um, and he's asking his buddy to explain the girl that he's in love with. But it turns out that the girl is not a girl at all, but his buddy doesn't know how to tell him that. You know, see, dun, 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 dun. hey, baby, what's that on the corner? Hmm? Come on, explain it. And he's talking to his buddy. And that was become, well, somehow A&M Records took my music and it became, and then it became, then after that we had the, the last poets started doing it. Gil Scott Herring started telling these stories again, not just, w I'll meet you at the bar in five minutes. It was, it was stories, and that's how, because I wanted to do political work, that's how I got the, the, the music politicized. And then that evolved again into what we now call rap, LL Cool J, and then the, the last poets, and that's, that's how it all happened. Um, there's an account of um, your time in France when people tell you, in a similar fashion, I imagine, as you just went off there, um, that even after you just moved there, um, you'd be telling those people that had lived there all their lives stories from the 14th arrondissement. Uh, yes. And, and like this observing nature, I mean, to tell a story, you first of all need to observe what's going on. Well, you know, there, there's a whole French tradition called the uh, le chanson realiste, the, the realistic s song. There's a, a guy named who's very famous called Aristide Bruant, who wrote, um, A la Bastille, on a potion, elle est si bonne et si gentille. It's a, about a hooker of the, of the Bastille. There are all these stories that, and I'm, I'm sure I was very strongly influenced by that, but that had not, early on, in American music, especially black music, you would get 
you would get get those songs. But then um, it, it it sort of got washed out. I mean, for example, good night, Irene. Good night, Irene. Good night. I'll get you in my dreams. I'll, in when the song was taken for what they call public consumption, meaning um, the majority white consumption, they changed the lyrics from I'll get you in my, my dreams, which means, of course, I'll, we'll have sex in my, my dream, to I'll see you in my dream. Who gives a shit if you see somebody? <laughs> but it's the things where these little changes change the, changes the, the political and the real, the real meaning. And um, so that's just what I did. And can you imagine when, when the, the major part of the political um, um, riots began to happen in America, we still did not have music pushing, the, talking about the problems in America, talking about the problems. And so, but then now, then they say, that gave the possibility, once I made money, then we, we could begin to have rap and all the other things. So that's what happened. Hold on, maybe I got some. You can go ahead and talk while I look. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, um, while you're looking there, um, for your back, it's like a. Um, when there's depictions of you as a little boy on the south side, and it might be probably worth talking about the sa south side in the first place of Chicago. And because there's quite a few characters that hail from there. But when I piece all the depictions together, I picture a character that's somewhere across between, I don't know, Steve Urkel and Kanye West in a way. Mm -hmm. So. No, no not at all. The, 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 it was <laughs> the south side of Chicago was like the old west. I mean, before I was 10 years old, just looking out the window, I'd seen nine people killed. I mean, but you, you didn't think about it in that way at, at that time at all. This, there's a difference between living a life um, that these people lived with. You take Kanye West, you take the other people, th their bling is they, they're aware that the world is watching them. Um, so it, it ain't quite the same thing when you're not aware of you're just doing things. For example, there's a song called I Hear You Knocking, <coughs> But You Can't Come In. Um, the song, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. Come back tomorrow night and try it again. So what's the song really saying? When the blacks left the South and would come North, many times the men could not find work. And the woman is, has to become a prostitute. And she is saying to her lover, her real man, that she's got a customer. Um, if you don't know these, these things, that's, it doesn't have the bling associated with it. It has, I got to feed the kids. Um, and it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole different thing. Now it's chic to be that. It wasn't nothing chic about it. It's just you get your brains blown out. Um, quite a different, quite, quite a different um, way of, of something being. Hold on here. Let me see. I, I want to see if I can get some, find some of this shit. Yeah. It's good that the Alzheimer doesn't still touch the cursing bits then. That must be comforting. Oh, here, I, I want to put on, um, I want to put on probably one of my favorite songs, just a little bit it. And I, I explain, does, does this thing work? I hope so. Okay, we're in business then.
So this is probably if I had, if I had to, everybody can hear me when I talk, right? I don't need this fucking thing. Okay. Uh, um, I guess we kind of need it for the recording yeah. purposes, well, but. Um, yeah. Let's talk about storytelling. I'm in um, I'm in a hotel in New York, and there was this young lady who was with me. Can everybody hear me? Huh? Yeah, fine. I prefer. Um, and um, she reminded me of someone, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And finally, I put my finger on it. She reminded me there used to be a cartoon character called Tweety Bird. Hmm? And after we made love, she jumped up and she started dancing. And I said, oh shit, hmm? she looks like Tweety Bird. <laughs> that was, Tweety Bird was a quite a pretty bird, by the way, I want to say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was no put down, she looked like Tweety Bird. But anyway, how I worked, this, this evolved into another, into a story. And I'm gonna tell the story and then I'll just, I'll, I'll play this and then I won't bore you with this shit anymore, but it, it's very interesting is that I wanted, a guy is in jail hmm, and he's going to be executed. He's going to, and he's explaining why he's in jail um, just before the, the, they, they come to execute him. Now music hadn't been done like this in many years when I restarted this stuff. Uh, and, uh, okay, play it. But you see, my public understood what this meant. And the guy is going to the electric chair. This became a very famous underground hit. Hmm? Lily doing the Zambuji. I would like you to play just one more piece of another song, please. Okay. Number six. I was talking to you earlier about Kent and Greenwich. You see, uh, these songs had not been put in a form that people knew what a picaresque, what an interesting, colorful life they were living. And this once more allowed people to start living this life. Yeah, okay. <coughs> once what, I, what I tried to do and what was followed up and what's now happening, the, the events of everyday life of us in the ghetto, I tried to once again, we, we had that, the events of on the farm and the cotton, et cetera, et cetera. But, it, but as it, we, we came north, much of this was lost. And this is what I, I put back again. And what has now been taken on, and the guys have done beautiful work with, with the rapping and with the other part of the music. And that's, um, that's, that's what happened. I'd be remiss, I'm just gonna play one other little piece of something of another, of another thing that um, the first one, this is the end of this whole series of music that I did on A&M Records. And this is called Put a Curse on You. At the end of a Broadway show of mine, now nothing like this had been done before. Now it, it seems ubiquitous. Um, everybody's doing it in, in, in a much smoother version, et cetera. But at the beginning, it was, people were just couldn't figure out what was going on. At the end of the show, after these songs eventually became a big Broadway hit, at the, at the end of the show, as the show is ending, it's everything, the finale, 
and it's all closed down, it suddenly stops. Because it ends on a note of, well, this is how life is. But that's not my personality. I'm sort of a fighter. And an old lady, an old bag lady, comes forward out of the audience and begins to tell the this, this story and puts everything into a completely different perspective. Probably explain the term bag lady because it oh, might be a bit of a... Yeah, well, a bag lady is, is a lady clochard, is a lady tramp um, who's been, through, throughout the play, she's been wandering around, hmm, just watching everything, and you just think she's, she's insane. You just think that um, that's her. But no, that's, that's not it at all. There's a, she understands, and she sums up, in this case, the author's point of view about racism at the time. And it's called Put a Curse on You. Um, oh, it's, a, it's the first one on this one. Sorry. Put a curse on you! Get the context right for those that didn't get it in the first place. This is the end of a Broadway show, a theater show, on probably one of the world's most known theater streets, arenas. And at the end of a play that already um, <coughs> talks about things that are not exactly the classic Broadway material. Right. Um, yeah, that's... I guess about as intense as audience interaction can go if you're not uh, Bertolt Brecht or someone. Well, what happened, hmm? it changed everything because not only was it about something, but it made money. And at that juncture, the doors that were closed to Kane, um, LL Cool J, everyone else opened because the the American dollar is if you can make money um, then you can say what you want to say so that's what happened there's a great um, quote of you saying whatever you do and whatever cause you're fighting it's important that the big boys win if you win could you elaborate on that exactly it's uh, well it's Part of the system, maybe if you want, the, the, the trick is you figure out a way to do something hmm, that what you want to do, but if it can make money, they will carry your message. The people were so hungry to, to hear themselves, to see their thoughts, some thoughts that they many times didn't even know they were thinking, projected until, of course, they, they bought it. There's a, something pretty intricate about what you just said, which is very essential for everyone who ever tried to convey any sort of message in form of storytelling. It's um, you sit there in front of, let's say, your empty piece of paper, and you think, whatever I got to say doesn't mean anything to anyone else. I can just talk about everyday things because that's my everyday life. But I guess you've overcome that very notion maybe at least two or three times well b b what you do you say how can I put it in a in a form hmm, that will get to maybe not the every audience but your audience now we talk about the filmmaking and black exploitation and all of that all of that sprang from my one of my films uh, uh, a sweet back but now, the Museum of Modern Art is just, I have to go back to New York. They're, they're giving me a, a big restoration of my film, which is a huge honor and all of that. But when the film came out, only two theaters in the entire United States, in the world, would show the movie. Only two, I didn't say two cities, two theaters. But I had... I knew my audience, and that was so successful, the film, until, of course, then everyone else took the film. Hmm? 
mm, afterwards. But that then allowed, then they, after that you had Shaft and you had the other things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What happened, of course, is my work is a little ferocious. They, they made it a little more acceptable to the mainstream and the music a little more acceptable to the mainstream, but still it had to carry p a part of the message. And um, so that's what happened. Here's a, um, I don't know if everybody is aware of the music of Sweetback or something like that. But, um, but before we go into the music of Sweetback, um, I guess there's about 12 days at least worth of talking about certain signifying moments of that. Um, <coughs> and I mean, according to the American um, ideal, it was the biggest crossing movie of 1972, which um, obviously gives you a lot of relevance in American mainstream thinking in the first place. But you achieved that with um, pretty radical statements in visual form and musical form and I guess your average Oklahoma audience would be kind of disturbed by the opening credits alone. Well, well what happened, um, it's quite complicated. It, it makes common sense, but it still was complicated. No, I take that back. It was only complicated if you're racist. If, the the major cities in new in america had a large african american population and the movie theaters were closing because they had nothing relevant that they wanted to see so i simply wrote a relevant movie and that population i, I probably made 8 million dollars before three white people had even seen the fucking movie <laughs> Um, but then once everybody starts seeing and start understanding what the, the relevance, then I became um, um, the, the other thing when it could not be ignored anymore. That's what happened. And uh, the, the music, of course, Quincy Jones, who you heard you talking about a while, he says something. He says, um, let's leave a little room for, for luck or for God, et cetera. When I was, when I'd written the movie and shot the movie, I had not yet done the music. And I was looking around and trying to find a group because I didn't have time to, to teach people to play as a group. I needed a group that had a habit of playing with themselves. And um, my secretary was sleeping with this one guy. Hmm? And she says, um, and they were all living in a little room um, in Hollywood, about 12 of them. And she said, you must, you must see these guys. And I went to see these guys, and it was Earth, Wind, and Fire. And um, so they had never done an album before, um, and I wrote the music. And since I can't really read or write music, I, I hummed the thing, or I played all the, all, I taught them my musical method. And they, they took the method, and then they, they played the music as, as I would ask them to, and that became um, a huge hit. And I'm going to play a little bit of, of Sweetback's theme, okay? Let's go to number four. Now, before this, just just the same before music even in hollywood was not used as a selling tool music came after the film they bring the film out even if they even if hollywood bought bought a broadway musical they would they would bring it out as a film and then maybe they'd bring out the album since i had no money i had this this idea i said oh shit hmm? Since it would cost you a lot of money for a 15 minute, 15 second commercial, but the, the song would run three minutes or so. So what I did, and you get paid besides. 
So I wrote the song and gave the song the title of the film. So every time they played the song, they were plugging my movie. Duh. Hmm? Hmm? Nobody ever thought of it. Huh? And that's, that's what I did. And then I called, um, I was known a little bit by that time, and all the, the, the DJs, the, the, the black DJs and the hip white DJs would play my music. And there they were, I was getting my fucking song plugged all over, huh? Then because of the revolutionary aspect of the film, the Black Panthers um, made it required viewing. All of their members were required to go see the movie. And then that changed everything. That's when films started putting music um, before the film sometimes. And uh, that's what happened. The next thing, the next time they tried that was with a movie called Shaft. And Shaft became a huge hit, um, music and film. And so ever since then, you get music, every piece of shit film got, got a soundtrack. Okay. Do you reckon, <coughs> you reckon anyone in the, the Panthers at that time would have thought like what impact them being there around? I mean, is there so many hermeneutic um, labyrinths there? As in like Pan you doing this movie, Panthers getting inspired by it, disinspiring the generation of the public enemies and the spy cleats and so on, which again are inspiring people all over the world again, which then again feed back into this system. And it's just like, just from maybe that one decision of um, Bobby Yui or whoever going like, yo boys, go and, go and see this film. Well, the real answer to that is fuck yes. Hmm? Huh, I expected it. Hmm? Um, often when I get in a fight, someone will say to me, Melvin, how did you know you could beat that guy? I don't know I could beat him. I just knew I wasn't going to take it. And it's been like a rowboat in the fog. Um, or when you go hitchhiking, you don't, you know, you stand there long enough, somebody should pick you up. So, so that's, uh, you, you can't afford to ask yourself that question. Bec or you can't, because you can intimidate yourself with that question. Well, I, I'm not a success yet. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not how many times you get knocked down that counts in life. It's how many times you get up. So that's how you do it. Hmm? That's uh, I, 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 had, I had hoped these things would come to pass. I did not know in what fashion they would come to pass. I did not know they would start having things on Broadway or start this. But you know you, you got to be in it to win it. So what the hell? be in it. And the first thing you learn as a hunter is you never back a dangerous animal into a hole because he's got nothing to lose. I had nothing to lose. After that, you're a rich man. When you say your politics is to win, like who do you win against, or what is the fight? Whoever's fucking with me. That's um, pretty simple yeah. and pretty straight to the yeah. point. Yeah. Not very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I was on, <laughs> I was on, um, um, on a bandstand once with um, um, Patty um, LaBelle, and somebody in the audience started giving me a hard time, and everybody said, so I jumped off the stage. Now, you see, many times a person will assume because you are who you are hmm, that they wouldn't say the same thing that you were in the street or sitting at a bar, but they think that they can say things there and, and the rules are you must take it. No, 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 no. Don't There's a first rule of the lock is don't write no check with your mouth. 
that your ass can't catch. Hmm? <laughs> you, you do it. So, I didn't know. I had nothing to lose. I had nothing to lose. So there you go. Um, we do understand you take that aspect and that um, approach literally everywhere. Um, well, on a personally traumatic note, when I dropped out of college was because I got so fed up with um, a course on African-American movies where they would talk and talk for like four hours straight about this and that and da 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 da, -da. And it's like, how on earth can you talk about this movie without ever mentioning something like friendship and like brotherhood and that kind of stuff because some have the feeling they play a bit of a role in there and this lady looks at me for a minute straight and she goes on like uh, well how about the portrayal of the welfare queen yeah. and I'm like uh, okay and I somehow well I just walked out in that case because I figured okay this place is probably not 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 the right for me now, I understand you had similar incidents in academic discussions, and um, you went a little bit further. Well, we point, I mean, there were so many of them. You, took, um, you, you have one, and give me a hint of which one you're talking about. I'm always in trouble. <laughs> um, you, were not re you were not really agreeing with something someone in the audience said in a very highbro academic discussions, and I think you took it back. Um, I threw him down the elevator, yes. <laughs> oh. the, uh, for the, 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 the movie, Sweetback, um, the guy owed me money because you see independent distributors would pay you if they wanted to. No, no, no. And so I, if you're ever in New York and you're walking down 57th Street, and if you could flash back, you would see a guy dangling out the window. <laughs> it will be good. But he paid me. If not, I would have dropped him. <laughs> yeah, and I guess in similar incidents, professors in, at Highbro universities weren't safe from you either. Yeah, well, the, I, I, I won't take it. I mean, I, what the hell? I mean, you know, life is short, and there's nothing worse. Uh, as I said, I was in the military. There's nothing worse if your plane's on fire and you say, oh, shit, I should have done this, I should have done that, I should have done the other. Go ahead and do it. So you don't, otherwise you get an ulcer. Who, what the hell? And as you learn in, in the plane as well, there's always ups and downs somewhere along your journey if you really want to get somewhere. Yeah, they're, they're, I don't really have a lot of ups and downs, frankly. Um, once... I decided it's all part of the trip. Um, you don't mind. You don't mind me. You just, oh, okay. Okay, fine. In fact, with that philosophy, I get laid a lot too. You know what I mean? You ask. Everybody says, well, would she say yes or no? Duh, ask. You know what I mean? <laughs> You'd be surprised, guys. Really, really, there's a lot of nice ladies out there. <laughs> I guess that's what they credit you with, um, the so-called art of the possible. No, it's just, it's called just being kind and nice and gentle. <laughs> or pretending to. <laughs> and if something doesn't work out, just throw them down the elevator. Exactly. <laughs> Not very complicated. <laughs> Well, speaking of politics and winning, obviously this summer and most of the last 12 months um, have been pretty busy with um, a really intricate, uh, interesting um, little process in America currently. Or, in short, do you think Obama's got any chance to win this? I never discuss politics. I, uh, I do politics. What's the difference? Well, one, somebody said, you said, blah, 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 blah. Then the other one said, no, no, don't do that, motherfucker. No, that's a difference. Huh? There's, there's, I, I, I may help these people immensely or not immensely, but it would be foolish for someone of my renegade status to say one thing or the other, which could eventually be used against that person. You mean like the ludicrous incident? 
like any, I never say anything about anything. The only thing that catches a fish is the mouth. If you keep his fucking mouth short, shut, he wouldn't get caught. Hmm? There's another one for my calendar. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <coughs> Speaking of catchphrases, um, at the end of Sweetback, there's a quote from the Bible. Now, this is coming uh, from the same man who said uh, he wants to take s movies, and especially from that demographic, away from the lynch mob, the Bible, and the hymn. And still, you make him say, if my feet don't fail me now. Yes. Yeah. That's not the Bible. It's, it's in the Bible. But, you, uh, but that's also a, f a phrase. Is, Come on, feet, cruise for me, trouble, ain't no place to be. Come on, feet, do your thing. Dun, 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 dun. Well, we, we can put that one on. What he's saying, what I did with the, with the religious songs, the other thing I do, because many of those, those beliefs were holding the people in bondage. It's very interesting with you. So I took the subtlety of those things and stood them on their head. I'm not very big, and so I use judo. I use the strength of my opponent. Hmm, to so you take what the opponent holds most sacred or what he's using, and then you flip it on him. So the, if you're looking at it, um, hold on one second. Let me, let me look at that. Put on number three instead of four. Right now? What I did was take one of the reasons the Black Panthers like this movie so much. I took all of the major cultural fears of the black community and debunked them. That is, I tore them down. That's why the guy is chased by dogs at the end that he ends up killing. And also this other belief in God and Lord will help me, this, that, the other, et cetera, et cetera. I took that and the guy, when he's saying, come on feet, cruise for me, cruise me and help me get away. I took those, those requirements and stood them on their head. That's, that was the, that it was what it seemed to be at the moment and then you take it and say, hey, there is a way out of this. That's why you, you had the church thing in it. Um, modest as he is, um, he's also been the first black trader. Um, I kind of I found it interesting because then when you found all the documents, they actually call it black trader, which obviously in a European university, which you would be called to call it an African-American trader. Mm -hmm. And um, which one would you prefer in the first place? I don't give a shit. <laughs> So, nevertheless, you were another first. I mean, this like throughout your career, you always you had a lot of firsts. Yeah, yeah. But um, I guess the the trading one and the Wall Street one, especially with the events of the last ten days or so, is always a really, really um, special one. No, no, no. It, it's uh, how I went to work on Wall Street was I lost a bet and the. The, what we call vigorous, meaning the, the, the cost of the bet, losing was that go to, because I was sitting with some friends once, and um, some very, very rich friends, and we were talking, and a guy said something, and I said, oh, that's, mm, I could do the numbers in my head. He said, and everybody said, you can do that? I said, yeah. And so they got the machine, you know, the, the computer out, and they said, shit, he's right. And one of my other friends, who's particularly Machiavellian, said, wow, huh? And he's a big mocker on Wall Street, and, and he's a troublemaker, too. So being so big, he got me the job hmm, to be a trader on Wall Street. And so that's how I ended up on Wall Street. How long did you find that fun? It was it was quite interesting. It was quite quite interesting because, you know, when you as an artist, if you write something and then you this and this and, and as a person, you you're never f finally sure you, it's made it practically. And but on Wall Street, if you made a bad trade, 
by the evening, you know you've made a mistake. And so it's, <laughs> it's right then and there. However, very interestingly, I did trade zillions of dollars all day. I never made a mistake, not once. Now, it's not true. I made mistakes, but very interesting in fact, many of the people who worked on Wall Street were minorities, but they never were elevated to the full height of, of where I was. And if I was going to make a mistake, if I made a mistake, they would ignore me hmm. because they know I was making a mistake. So they protected me. Hmm. And so therefore, I ended up with never making a mistake. Hmm. And uh, that's what happened. Now, <clears throat> part of what they call the American dream is getting all those riches and stuff. And I guess you, up until 10 days ago, or maybe even now, even especially now, you don't get closer to that than on Wall Street. Um, how could you resist staying there? I got laid anyway. Mm. I had girls. What the fuck do I need Wall Street for? <laughs> um, now, I guess a couple of the characters over there would fit, fi um, when you say an artiste, um, quite a few characters there would um, like to consider themselves to be artists as well. I don't consider myself an artist. I just, <laughs> no. I'm just uh, a loudmouth hmm, who's ready to back it up. That's all. Which can get you pretty far in the end. I, um, whatever, if tomorrow I discovered making ethanol or being a, a planter in a such and such would help justice for the minorities, etc., that I'm interested in, I do that. I don't give a shit. When you were on the floor over there on that street on the south tip of Manhattan, and thinking back to your uh, the days when the Panthers were looking up to you, or yeah, I guess they were, and uh, to a degree, um, do you reckon there's any revolution in America would be possible in the first place? And could it be that without being an economic revolution? Well, you, you actually, you, you're not, l let's be very clear about revolution. Are you meaning racial revolution or are you meaning the whole structural revolution? Which one of those do you mean? Um, that was actually part of the question and then like a hidden little pajama there. Well, then you define, you tell me yours, and I'll show you mine. <laughs> you first. <laughs> so, okay, when, when you were talking about revolution earlier, is, um, w to which degree did you want to change things? What did you want to have as the end result? What, what, uh, what is your vision there? <laughs> you, you notice he slid around the question, right? You know, but what I meant was almost um, I meant a little like you remember you know Christmas you know peace and will and love to all mankind nah, 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 nah. well you got to do that step by step and one of the, the major steps mm -hmm. that had to happen and still has to happen is we get our shit together not just America not just uh, um, Barcelona not just uh, but everybody, the, the, being a, maybe it's being an astronomer looking out there and, and seeing the, the whole possibility. We can, we're fairly fortunate as a race. By that race, I'm talking about homo sapiens. I'm talking about the human race. And maybe we can get our shit together. But it's step by step, fire by fire. This was, this was a fire that, that, that I was, had particularly acute sensibilities that I could could be the effective. So you can't do everything this. I'm just one victory at a time. And a part of that victory was you, you guys must realize that the young people and you folks here doing this music now and doing the other thing, that is making a change. Hmm? That is giving an overview. That is people from all over the world here or are sitting down and seeing the unity th that once it was 
everybody was like that's because only about four people in the whole damn tribe. And then as we we moved around to the various parts of the world, it it made it easier for the the greedy to put one group against another. But n through music and through the other things, it's coming together. Uh, that's I think. What I meant was that I'm just talking in a very large, very large philosophical way. I'd like peace on earth, you know, hark the heralds, angels sing, glory to the, 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 you know, peace on the, the, the whole world. That's what I'd like. Now, in the meantime, you may have to kick a motherfucker's ass. Hmm? Okay, so be it. Hmm? What part of that would be just for your entertainment? Huh? What part of that ass kicking is just for entertainment purposes? I met her last night. <laughs> <coughs> Let's get, get not into specifics there. But um, <coughs> but speaking of speaking about kicking some ass, um, I found it pretty interesting or curious, as they say around here, um, that for the movie Free Day Pass, people were actually accusing you, especially when you have various scenes of Sweet Sweet back in the back of your mind, that f after Free Day Pass, you were accused of your movie being too melancholic, a little bit too soft almost, and it was lacking the violence. Like... Well, you, you, you've got to realize something. Christ was nothing but a carpenter in his own hometown, you know what I mean? So, what the whole thing? You, sometimes you go step by step. Okay, that's a very interesting question, and I want to repeat it so you, you'll understand. I, my first feature was a, a French movie. I made it as a French director because I discovered there was a possibility if I twisted the, the bureaucracy, a way of getting a director's card. Okay, so I made a film that was very, very kind to the French. That allowed me to break Hollywood, so that's what I did. Um, sometimes you have to turn left to do right, and um, that's, it's a sweet film. Fine, so everybody assumes I'm going to make nice, sweet films. Okay, hmm? you got to do what you got to do to get where you got to go. Uh, that's all. When you do write something, no matter whether it's a song, some form of text in the classical sense, as in a book, or a movie script, and there is a depiction of violence, do you ever think about consciously, like, okay, is this actually really necessary in this second to get my point across, or do you just indulge in liking to do that? Um, the truth of the matter is, I assume that I am walk on water. And the truth of the matter is, I do what the fuck I like. I make movies, I do music and everything else like I cook. I put in what I like in case no one else wants to eat it, I have to eat it for the rest of the week. Hmm? So what I do, <laughs> when I, when I write a play, I mean, I hope they like it, but they don't. Hmm? I do. Um, I mean, I can sit there and, and watch Sweet Back or Don't Play as Cheap or this. Ah, I have a good old time. There's nothing. I tell you, the worst feeling you can ever have is doing something for others. Hmm? And then they don't like it either, and then you're really fucked. <laughs> I mean, to... Because we had someone here earlier who talked about destroying the Lego city after they build it. And, you know, like that, all political things aside, blowing up a police car and making it burn is great fun, isn't it? Yeah, it was quite difficult, as a matter of fact. Um, quite difficult. And that was, that was a, good, a good sequence. You, you see, you don't get to do these things the way I did them, that's any fun. For example, there's a sequence, so everybody understands, the sequence in, in Sweetback where the, they blow up a police car. Okay, now that's a lot of money, right? And you gotta have permits. 
and you got to have this and that and the other. Hmm. Had an idea. I go on Friday to the to the place which allows you to have these explosions, etc. And I put it in on Friday. They give me the papers. I blow up the police car on Saturday. The police come. I got my papers because nobody had put the rest of the papers into the to Monday. Do you understand? But I counted on them being lazy. That's all. That's how I got away with that. But that was. But as far as fun. It was no fucking fun. Nothing was fun. I, I shot the movie with, with my guys and me with real guns because the, the film industry had claimed that they were going to shut me down. So um, when the, the sequence with, the, with, the, with um, a Hell's Angels type guys, after they'd worked a few hours, they said they wanted to go. I said, wait a minute, you've been paid, but we want to leave. Uh, the guy pulled out his knife and just started to clean his hands, and I did like this, and he goes, my guys had guns. They stayed. That's, it was fun. It was no fucking fun. You're just getting the fucking job done. Then that's fun when people are applauding, but that's before that time. Well, <clears throat> I guess a little bit more of the fun is in the actual creation of it, but how did you... Make, I guess it must. You must be hitting some world when you go from sitting on your typewriter and writing up a story or a script, and then all of a sudden you have to deal with this army of people, and you have this vision here somewhere. And I guess it's a similar thing, just on a smaller scale. If you're in a band or in a studio project, well, it's like with my typewriter. Everybody knows me. Hmm? Nobody fucks with me. Do it or. Your ass is mine. What's the hell? Every, my group moves. They don't move. They ain't there or they ain't there without bandages on. Period. I'm not the Salvation Army. Christmas Carol saved for later then. There you go. <coughs> but you do that hopefully so that we can have the young people and, and other people this do it under, not under those circumstances. But you can't play both sides of the street. You see, the questions you're asking me are war questions. We've had a truce because of the war. Uh, I mean, I, I had to, to beat up people. Okay, but to make it possible so that other people didn't have to. But on the other hand, don't re turn it around and make that, oh, how could you have done that? What the fuck? You wouldn't be here if I hadn't done that. Shit, there you go. <laughs> That's what happened. That's how you get it. But I didn't do it so that it, it, there's nothing major or good or anything else about it. It's just getting the job done. I guess you would need to clarify it a little bit because um, most of us have most of us, I guess, have been growing up in like the longest periods of peace. Um, when you say war questions, what do you specifically mean about that? War questions, I mean when I'm making Sweetback, the Teamsters, hmm, who... Labor union Teamsters. The labor, the labor unions and the other people all wouldn't do it. Or, and not only wouldn't do it, when they saw I was doing it, if, you, for example, if you made a movie in Hollywood at that time, if you got it, may, may, uh, and, and they saw the, the film, they would scratch the film. The laboratories would scratch your film so that it would be unusable. The people in the laboratories, they were in the union. So I had to cover all of that. There was no fun. I had to make sure that everybody, would, and now you all you have to do is say, Melbourne don't like that, and they know what that means. Speaking of the Hollywood system, as it's referred to a lot, um, in another movie, you kind of pulled like a reverse Al Johnson and um, instead and dealt with the whole thing of like... Um, Which movie? The one with the face covering. Oh, um, yeah, um, Watermelon Man. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, like, well, if, um, yeah, probably it's better if it's told by you anyway. Like I don't know the question. <laughs> <coughs> now, um, could you probably give us, like, a little explanation, like the movie Jazz Singer, what happened in that, the L. Johnson one? Oh, sure. Well, actually, what happened with um, this movie called, I don't know what it's called here. It was called Watermelon Man in, in the States. The guy, a white guy, turns black. And um, then he has to live with his sudden becoming black and how that, how that does his life up and so forth and so on. I did not write that script. The script was originally written by someone else. And there are a lot of funny, complicated stories. With it. This was a studio movie. And after Hollywood had let two um, black directors in, that was Gordon Parks and Ozzie Davis, and they were still keeping after me because of the success of my earlier French movie, hmm? I said, okay. However, to be explained, both of the other movies that they allowed blacks into after I sort of broke Hollywood, they didn't allow them to shoot them in Hollywood. They had to shoot them on location. Hmm? But the, the major prize was to shoot a movie in Hollywood. So I held out and I said, okay, I'll shoot the movie if I can shoot it in Hollywood. So they allowed me to shoot it in Hollywood. And then they gave me this script and it was nice. But what happened in the script, the guy wakes up at the end of the movie and he's white again. And I said I didn't, I wanted him to stay black. And so they, they wanted him white and I said I wanted him to stay black. And so we came to a compromise. We would shoot it both ways and then we would decide later on. So that's what we did. Except I didn't shoot it the other way, I just kept it my way. And uh, um, so the, the, I was busy with that battle to tell the honest to God truth. So, well, but that was fine with me. I, I put in the political things that I wanted to have said. The, I added the little things that I wanted added in. Um, and I didn't shoot it the other way, so you had to end up doing it my way. That was a treacherous piece of shit thing to do to the studio. Hey, what else is new? Hmm? Cheers. Um, did you hear anything about the movie Tropic Thunder? No. Okay, then next one. Save that one for later. Um, <coughs> one thing that's always, it, to a certain degree, um, I went, do you know this guy James Logan in, uh, in LA? The what? There's a guy in LA, James Logan, he does a lot of leather coats. Who? James Logan, I think his name is. Well, he, he did a lot of the, the movie coats, like what he calls hero coats. You know, long I leather, long, pl long black leather coats. What is he, he's an actor? No, 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 he's just a, what do you call him, a tailor? Maybe a leather tailor? And he does like a lot of the um, coats for modern day um, hero movies, action movies. Okay. And there's a certain type of um, code he would call a hero code. Now, um, if you uh, look back to certain movies, I have the feeling it's you might have something to do with, with that kind of look as well, adapting it and bringing it into popular culture. Let's, let's roll the, the, the tape back just a little bit to an earlier story. I said I used to live on the park bench in front of the Women's House of Detention. I was and I sang you that song. And one night I'm on the park bench and I hear this voice. This voice may say, Melvin, I'm fucking cold. Hmm? And what you do, I said, okay, because I've had money and blah, blah, blah. I said, make me one promise, Melvin. Okay, what is it, what is it? The next time we get money, hmm, buy me a coat. Okay, so the next time I got money, hmm, I went and had a coat made, like that long coat so I could, for stealing bread, and, uh, and then at night, the way you stay warm, you put newspaper, if the sleeves are wide enough, in, in your pants leg, and that keeps you warm. So that's what I did. Hmm? And maybe that became the style, I don't know, but um, I had the coat made, and n every now and then, um, I go to the closet, hmm? 
when things are particularly tough, and there's my coat. So if I'm back on the park bench, I, I'm warm. <laughs> That's not very complicated, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>